All right, thank you. I just wanted to, um, you, a lot of people said a lot of things that um, I, I wanted to say, so um, that's good, but there are a few things that I wanted to connect that to, which is that um, um, whether it's Pinchas or the daughters of Salafhad, um, or even Moshe, I believe that one of the greatest, or even Yeshua, um, I believe one of the greatest qualities of a leader is his or her willingness to stand up for what is right um, when it comes to others or even when it comes to themselves. And sometimes people feel that if they are standing up for themselves, that um, that it's selfish. And, you know, they, you know, there's this there's a there's a Jewish. Um, uh there's a Jewish thought that says that, you know, when you were reviled, that you should be silent. And Yeshua was an example of this. And in some instances, this is true, and this is correct, and that is what we should do. But we have to look at each and every situation um, independently and try to distinguish whether our silence is for the greater good or not and sometimes our silence is for the greater good it could and we could say oh you know i'm being so falsely accused of something but you know i'm just going to be quiet for now because it's not that big of a deal but sometimes if we are quiet and we don't stand up even for ourselves and also especially for others though then it sets a precedent and not only do we suffer but um many people will also suffer. And so Rashi comments on this Torah portion, and he says that the daughters of Salafhad, um, it's not, I used to think, you know, when I read this Torah portion that it was gonna be a certain way, um, but then because the daughters of Salafhad spoke up, then Hashem changed it. And if they hadn't spoke, spoken up, it would have been this other way. Right. But Rashi said, no, Rashi said the daughter, of the, the daughters of Salafad saw something that was already true. It was already there, but they saw something that Moshe didn't. So it wasn't that they caused a change in Torah principle or Torah application. It's that they uncovered it and revealed it. And one of the biggest, not biggest, but one of the gripes that I have about Jewish law, which ties to this story in specific, is the fact that a Beit Din must consist of three men. And this is rabbinic law. Um, and we honor it here at B'nai Avraham. We only allow men to be in the Beit Din. Um, when it comes to conversions and weddings and all that stuff. We honor it because, because it is religious law. But we do allow for women to be advisors, myself or anyone else that, um, that we feel can, can, can shed light on the situation or elevate the situation. But in Talmudic law, as I understand it, this this understanding that a Beit Din could only be three men and not women prevented the, this, this idea that it could only be three men and, and, and not three women prevented women from having freedom. For example, if a woman were to go out, and, and this is still applicable in Islamic law, in Sharia law, if a woman were to go out and she, let's say something happened to her, she was raped or something like that. If there were not three men who could testify for her, um, the, no one could be uh, condemned because Jewish law actually errs on the side of mercy. Sometimes it was so merciful that it prevented, um, it prevented uh, criminals from being punished. And so we don't allow that in the U.S. justice system today. We allow for the testimony of, of, uh, of women, yeah, two or three. Ideally, it should be three, but two is acceptable. And so back in the old days, um, which is, and 
in 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 in, uh, in Israel, um, a woman would always be always be accompanied by a man. The, the, a woman should had to be accompanied by a man, and this was one of the reasons. And um, you know, even if she, if she was robbed or something like that, like if she didn't know a man that would testify for her, she was in big trouble. It was very hard to get justice. And you know, I believe this type of injustice is one of the reasons why Hashem allowed. I'm sorry to say this, this can be maybe very controversial and maybe even negative to Judaism, but I, I believe this is one of the reasons why, why Hashem allowed the dissolution of the Sanhedrin. And I do believe that we are supposed to have a Sanhedrin, but you know, according to Orthodox Judaism, it will not be established unless Mashiach comes. And when Mashiach comes, I do believe he will set things right and um, do away with a lot of um, um, injustice that I believe rabbinic law unjustly imposed, which was against the Torah, as we see in this Torah portions um, story of the daughters of Salafhad. Anyways, the second thing that I want to talk about is um, is another Jewish leader um, in the spotlight currently this week who stood up for himself and for his people, just just like the pattern of Netanyahu, the daughter of Salafhad, um, and many others who came before him. And this is the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And of course, we say that you know, when it, on Shabbat, we're not supposed to talk about politics, and I believe that's true if we're not talking about principles and values that we are supposed to stand for in the Torah. But if we're but if we're talking about politics that have to do with principles and values that are found in the Torah, I believe we must talk about them. We must talk about them because we have to connect our faith, our Judaism, to real life. It can't just be, you know, ethereal and just out there in the clouds and only personal. It must affect our communities, our countries, etc. That's what the Torah is for. It's, it's a national constitution, so it should affect our lives. So he gave a speech today, and not today, excuse me, he gave a speech this week and every Jew should hear it. He is the leader of the, of the nation, of the land of Israel today. And every Jew should understand what he is communicating to the greatest power on earth that Hashem has ordained, which is America. It behooves every single Jew to listen to what he said. It was, um, it was a riveting speech it was um, the room stand stood up, the whole room stood up and clapped for him all throughout his speech. Like every other sentence he said, Congress stood up and clapped for him. Standing ovation multiple times throughout the speech. You have to listen to it. For a Jew, it is one of the one of the most important speeches this year, at least. And a few things that I noticed about his speech was that he acknowledged everyone. He 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 gave a bipartisan speech. He was not catering towards either the Republicans or the Democrats, even though I was told that it was mostly Republicans, Republicans that came and most Democrat and Democratic lead, leaders did not show up. And I don't believe it's because they didn't support Israel. I believe it's because they were scared to support Israel. I believe it's because the party, not necessarily all the people, but the party has positioned itself against Israel. And so there are a lot of people who may secretly support Israel in the Democratic Party, but they are too afraid of what might happen to their influence and position if they actually showed up. And that includes um, President Biden. So in his bipartisan speech, Prime Minister of the state of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, he, he first opened up by thanking all, all the people that he could. 
acknowledging all the people that he could that were in that room that day, in that stadium, in that hall, um, and acknowledging their bravery and their efforts. And he started with the story of three soldiers that were in attendance. One of them was an Ethiopian Jew, and his parents lived in Ethiopia. And when the nation of Israel um, finally opened up and started calling Jews home, um, his, his family immigrated to Israel. And he was a soldier, but he was not on active duty. And um, when he heard about the October 7th, about the October 7th um, attack, the baseless attack where 3,000 Hamas troops went in and invaded the homes of Jewish families and raped and murdered and kidnapped uh, babies, little children, couples, senior citizens, anyone. It didn't matter. They either they were either raped, uh, murdered, or kidnapped, or a combination of those. When he heard of the October seventh attack, he got on his military gear and he um, he got his gun. He got his rifle, but he had no car. And a lot of people don't have cars in Israel. And so what he did was he ran eight miles to Gaza in order to fight and defend his people and attack the, the, the terrorists. There's another soldier who lost his leg, one of his legs, and he lost sight in one of his eyes defending, um, defending Israelis. And, and Netanyahu said, as soon as he recovers, he's planning to go back and fight for the army as a commander. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. I, I would think, you know, if <laughs> I lost my one of my legs and one and one of my eyes, I, I, I would say, you know, I'm done. It's it's y'all's turn, but he's going back. And thirdly, there was a Muslim Bedouin soldier who fought for Israel. And for all those who don't know, the Bedouins are Muslims, but they love Israel and they love the Jewish people. So there's this understanding that you know, um, or not not this understanding. There's this there's this false there's these false accusations that Jews want to, you know, kill all Muslims. That's absolutely not true. Um, and and the Muslim Bedouin community is proof of that. And then he he acknowledged all the families of the hostages, including many of the ones that were freed. Um, who were present at that at his speech, and many of them were Americans, and we still have Americans who are being held captive by Hamas. And Netanyahu also acknowledged Biden for sending aid during Iran's missile strike recently. And by the way, in case you don't know, um, the Iranian people, many of them actually support Israel, and they do not like their government. They don't support their government. The Iranian people are being oppressed by their government just as much as Israel is. Um, and then he also acknowledged Trump for brokering the Abraham Accords. And if people don't know what the Abraham Accords was, this is something that Trump helped um, Trump helped with during his um, term as president, and this was this is historic because he got the United Arab Emirates and I, I think a few other um, countries to actually acknowledge that Israel exists. That's all it is. It's just can you acknowledge that Israel exists? And finally, some Muslim countries said, "Okay, yes, you exist." <laughs> That's what it was all about. Um, and he talked about how Iran is actually the puppeteer and that Iran is using Hamas and Hezbollah and other terrorist organizations to conquer Israel and, as, uh, as was stated, to eventually destroy America. And we have to remember that Hamas and Iran do not want a two-state solution. 
And I know there's, you know, as believers and as Jews, there, there's two sides, right? There's always two sides. Some people support the two-state solution, some people do not. The two-state solution, and I, I want to talk about this because a lot of our young people, maybe even adults, don't understand what's going on and don't understand what's being talked about in the media, okay? Two-state solution means to acknowledge that Israel, the nation of Israel exists, and the, and the nation of Palestine exists, that there are two states. That's the two-state solution. And Israel is all for it. Israel says, yes, uh, let's acknowledge that Palestine exists, and let's also acknowledge that we exist. And it is Hamas that continually rejects the two-state solution. And so when people you know, you know, you know, talk, you know, blame Jews for not, um, you know, not uh, pushing the two-state solution, Jewish, you know, Jewish uh, politicians, they're like, we want a two-state solution. It is Hamas who is control, in control of Palestine that does not want a two-state solution. And the reason why they don't want a two-state solution is because they don't want two states, they only want one state, they want the state of Palestine, and they want to be in control. And what happened in Israel is the same thing, or very similar to what happened in India um, years prior. And what happened in India was that Britain um, controlled all of India, and then Britain decided to stop being colonialist and to give back um, India to the Indian people. And in India, there were there were two major factions. There was there was the Hindus and there was the Muslims. And you know, a lot of Americans and a lot of seculars, they're like, oh, this is all about oil and money and control. And that's not true. This is about faith and religion and prophecy. The religions of the world are all trying to bring about their prophetic writings in some way, whether it's Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. It's extremely religious, everything that happens in the Middle, in the Middle East. So Britain withdraws from India, and the Muslims in India rise up, and they say, no, we don't want you to give control to India. We want, we want control of India. And of course, that wasn't going to happen. So what they ended up doing is they ended up dividing India into two countries, okay? But why? So that's exactly what Israel wants. So they want to divide it up so that there's Palestine and there's Israel. But Palestine is not happy. They want more. They want, actually, they want Jerusalem. That's one of the main things they want. They want Jerusalem. And if they agree to the current borders, that would mean losing um, losing the Temple Mount, which they don't own, but they have a they have a um they have a you know that gold thing <laughs> up on our mount. They have that, and and that's not even their most holy site, but um they want that, not because it's it's so important to them, it's really not that important to them. It's not like they they make pilgrimage there. Jews make pilgrimage to Jerusalem. We cannot give up Jerusalem. There's no way we can give up Jerusalem. And that's why when Trump acknowledged Jerusalem as the capital of, um, of Israel, which it already was, but many countries don't want to, um, many countries don't want to acknowledge it because they don't want to anger Muslims. And, you know, this is another thing where it's like, you know, if we want to truly be leaders in our spheres of influence, we have to not be afraid to make people angry. We need to speak up for truth and justice, regardless of who gets angry, because that is the tactic of evil. Make them scared to follow their God. Make them scared to stand up for righteous, righteousness and, and truth and the Bible. Make them ashamed to be Jews and Christians and people of faith and people who keep Shabbat or wear kippot or, you know, this is the tactic of our enemy to make us scared. 
which is why in the Torah, you know, Yehoshua, he was commanded, one of the first things he was commanded is, do not fear, do not fear, do not fear, because that is one of our biggest enemies is fear. And that is why evil persists oftentimes is because of fear. Israel was, he, Netanyahu reminded um, the crowd that Israel keeps on being called settlers and colonists. And he's like, don't you know that, don't they know that God gave Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob this land? Our ancestors were on this land. And the presence of Jews have never left the nation of Israel. There have been many colonialists and, and conquerors like Britain and Rome and, and et cetera. But there were always Jews in that land. And also that journalists and military leaders have called the army of Israel the most moral army in the history of the world. No other army in the whole entire world gives so much aid and warning to its enemies than Israel has and continues to do. Netanyahu talked about how they just recently gave tons of aid to Gaza and to Palestine. But who who is it that is who who is it that's preventing the aid from reaching the people? It's Hamas. It's the government. And there are testimonies of um, of Hamas of of Palestinians saying we're tired of Hamas. You know, Israel warns them about, you know, they're about to attack, evacuate the land. And they say, but then Hamas says, if you leave, we will kill you. you you're either going, and they even, they even boast, and they say that women and children make the best shields. Hamas has said that. So, and he, and so Israel is always being, you know, pointed at as, oh, you're, you're, you're trying to commit genocide. Look at, look at what you are doing. And it's like, no, they are taking as much steps as they can in order to be as humane as they can in this war and as merciful as they can in this war. But as Netanyahu said, we are not fighting another sort of civilization. We are fighting barbarism. And it's very hard to be civil to a barbarian because if they can't be civil to their own people, how can we extend you know, civility to them? They are preventing it to their own people. And he also said that um, one, of the, one of the things he said, wasn't the last thing he said, but one of the things he said was that if you remember nothing from my speech, he said, please remember this. If you remember nothing else, please remember this, that our fight in Israel is your fight in America. And he was talking about Iran, I believe mostly because Iran, you know, has sworn that they want America, but, you know, they got to take care of Israel first because that's their, basically America's major ally in the Middle East. But I was thinking, you know what? I don't think that's true for all Americans. There's a lot of Muslims here who want Sharia law to be instituted in America. That's just true. So that's not their fight. The, that fight is, is not their fight. And there's also a lot of secular Americans who really don't care about, um, about what's going on Iran in the Middle East. And they're like, okay, well, yeah, maybe Iran doesn't like us and they wanna, they wanna, they said they're gonna kill us one day, but we don't believe it's really gonna happen. We don't care. So it's not really their fight, right? So in, in a way, I would say to Netanyahu, it's not every American's fight. What's happening in Israel is not every American's fight. However, for Jews and for Christians and anyone who, you know, respects the Bible and the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, it is our fight. That's, that's our fight. And so, you know, I encourage you. I, of course, Israel is not perfect. Netanyahu is not perfect. King Cyrus in the Bible was not perfect, but he was called Mashiach. Did you know that? King Cyrus, a secular king, a non-Jewish pagan king, was called a Mashiach because he helped to deliver and save the Jewish people. Right? That's what Mashiach, that's what a Mashiach does. That's what Mashiach is. 
um, and he wasn't perfect. King Solomon wasn't perfect. When was the nation of Israel ever perfect or deserving of Hashem's love? Never. And that's the same with Israel and our political leaders today. But the land is holy. The land is holy. And the land will spew out, as Hashem said, will spew out those who do, do not respect Hashem's land. And so Muslims will not do that. Hamas will not do that. Palestinians will not do that. But they want Hashem's land. They don't just want Gaza. They want Jerusalem and every single part of Israel. And I'm not sure what's going to happen in this next election. But as Jews, this is our fight. And we must do whatever, whatever it, it, we can in our power to secure our homeland, the homeland of Mashiach, of Moshe, of David, of the daughters of Salahad, of Pinchas.